for the record, I am the youngest minority leader that the House of Representatives in Missouri has ever seen, and could quite possibly in the country right now. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, I grew up in Webster County, uh, so very close to here, and uh, went to Rogersville High School, and I'm a first generation high school graduate. And I knew nothing about government or politics or cared about anything until I was at Missouri State University uh, studying social work is what my degree is in. And they made us take a policy class. And I realized very quickly that everything I wanted to do as a social worker to help families like mine um, get better in, in their uh, existence was dictated by government policies. Um, so as in things like, you know, who qualifies for state aid, or as a social worker, how many clients I can work with at one time. All of that is dictated by government. So uh, my senior year at Missouri State, you have to do an internship as a social work student, and I decided to go to Jefferson City. I was the first social work student at Missouri State to go through their legislative internship program. So I got to convince the political science department why a social worker should care, and convince the social work department that political science made sense with what we were trying to do in the world. Um, when I got to Jeff City, um, it's kind of a running joke that we have. The first couple weeks you're there, you look around and you're like, how did I get here? This is amazing. And then week two or three, you're like, how did these other people get here? They don't know anything. And it was even true as an intern. When I got there, I realized that there were so few representatives who represented the areas that I cared about. So I'm, I'm somebody who grew up in poverty. I have lost siblings to opioid overdose. And as a social worker, there just were not enough folks there who understood that kind of line of thinking, uh, making policy. When you look at our state budget, which is about $30 billion, uh, the biggest chunk of that goes to social services. And frankly, there are just not enough people in Jefferson City who have either lived that life or worked in that life to understand exactly how we're spending that money and whether it's efficient or not. So I graduated um, in 2008, and I decided to, um, I, honestly, internships open up a whole lot of doors for you. I recommend them if you can find them. I graduated on a Friday, and on Monday, I started working for the United States Senate for Claire McCaskill's office here in Springfield. So what I did for her office was constituent services work. Essentially, when somebody had a problem with the state agency, I helped them get it fixed. So very much like a social worker, but on the federal government level. I did that work for a couple years and then went into the campaign world. I worked for an organization called Organizing for America, which I was a community organizer. That entity started after Obama was elected. And so my job was to literally train people in the community how to contact their legislators. You're mad about something, this is how you go about trying to fix it. Um, and I enjoyed doing that until I got farmed out to work on a Senate race. Um, outside of my control, the staff kind of got shifted over and I hated every second of the campaign life. So then I went and worked in the nonprofit sector. I worked for an organization based out of Springfield called Care to Learn. And what we do is provide basic funding needs for children in poverty um, in partnership with school districts. So my job was to teach people how to raise money and to understand poverty from an educational standpoint. And I did that work until this seat opened up. Um, so my first election was in 2016. Um, the guy that I interned for actually was termed out. So that was very cool that I got to then run for his seat when he was done. Um, so in 2016, I ran my first race. I had a primary and a general election. Um, I raised and spent about $125,000 for that race. Um, my opponent, uh, there was about $200,000 spent against me on the other side. Uh, won that election, um, went to Jefferson City, uh, spent my first two years really working on the budget committee, was uh, where most of my energy has been spent, and then had, ran for re-election in 2018. Um, and I did not have a primary that time, just a general election. I won with about 65% of the vote, and then decided to run for a minority floor leader. What that job is, is I am essentially captain of the Democrats in Jefferson City. Um, I choose what committees the members serve on. I uh, help, help facilitate our floor strategy, our media strategy, pretty much everything that we're doing in the House as a caucus, I am in charge of. Um, I have a team of 48 caucus members. It is very small. Yes, we are in a super minority out of 163. There are 48 of us. Um, but I have a really great team of people who are working really hard for our issues. Um, and I will serve in this capacity for two years. Um, I'm also in charge of the campaign side for the House Democrats as well in this capacity, um, which is really why I decided to jump in on that um, as early as I did in my career. I have uh, the opportunity for two more elections, so I am up again in November of this year, and um, I can serve four more years. We have eight years total in the House, and then I can move over to the Senate if I try 
to go that route. So I am a mom of three. Uh, my kids are uh, here. I've got one at Boyd Elementary School and then two at Central. Um, and my husband and I live like three blocks from here in Midtown. Um, that's my summary in a nutshell. Um, uh, why why uh, the Democratic Party? Do you yes. gravitate to that political party? Yes. Yeah, so um, as I said, I grew up in a family that wasn't super political, but I can tell you that my parents are uh, avid Republican voters. My dad still is he wears a Trump hat every day, and it makes uh, family dinners really fun. Um, but no, honestly, um, when I got into this, it wasn't about political party for me. I actually started as somebody more on the burn it all down, this two-party system is nonsense world. Um, I was more of an activist than I was an organizer when I first got started. Um, I am one of the people who fundamentally believes that if you want to fix a system, you do it from the inside out. Um, in our current system, we obviously have two parties in, in Jefferson City. The more that I've done this work, um, the more that I have gravitated to being a very proud Democrat. There are a lot of things within my party that I don't agree with and a lot of things that I want to make better. Um, but honestly, the policies that the two sides look at, this is one that I gravitate more towards. Um, the policies, especially Jefferson City, that we work on, in my opinion, are much more people-focused. I am kind of a bottom-up believer in investment. If we are investing people at the bottom, then we see a trickle-up effect to help our economy and to help folks. Um, and just time and time again, when I look at the different policies that the different sides are working on, I align myself more with democratic values. Um, for me, the biggest things that I care about are healthcare access. I believe that healthcare is a right and that some, everybody should have equal access to healthcare and um, that it shouldn't be something that bankrupts you and destroys your entire life. Uh, same for education. Um, being a first generation high school graduate, it's very important to me that um, our education systems are equal everywhere. It shouldn't be based on zip code. Um, and that it shouldn't matter how active your parents are for how good of an education you have. Um, and those are the two most important issues for me personally. Um, human rights are definitely something that I care a lot about. I'm a huge advocate for the LGBT community and trying to get uh, the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act passed. Um, and so again, those are the kind of values that I adhere to and uh, the Democratic Party just tends to align more with, with those folks. Since you mentioned it, Give us a nutshell on the Non-Discrimination Act. Yeah, so in Missouri right now, uh, you can be fired or denied housing. So you could be denied a lease um, depending on your uh, status. Um, so if you are a gay individual or your employer believes you to be gay, they have every right legally to fire you or to not deny you housing. Um, and so the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act uh, has been filed for 22 years in Missouri. And what that would do is add the LGBT community to those protections that you already see for age, gender, and ability. Um, and race are already protected under the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act for housing and employment, and this would add the LGBT community to that as well. Okay, so uh, I want to open the floor in a moment. Uh, we're, we're, anybody has some questions, ruminate at them on a minute, uh, for a minute or two. Let me warm up the room a little bit by asking, really, these are questions from other students, and we have talked about both these issues a lot in this class. Okay. We talked recently about clean Missouri, um, and of course, cleaner Missouri. Uh, what's your opinion? Uh, this is from Amanda Theroff from 9 a.m. What's your opinion on Clean Missouri and those trying to overturn it? Yeah, so um, I did vote for Clean Missouri. Um, I will tell you there are a couple provisions of it that I didn't like, um, but overarchingly I supported Clean Missouri. Um, and in terms of overturning, I am just fundamentally against the legislature overturning uh, the vote of the people. Um, so even if didn't agree with Clean Missouri. 62% of Missourians just last year, last election cycle, told us they wanted it. We haven't even seen it implemented yet, so I do believe that it's wrong for the legislature to come right back and say, you guys were dumb, don't know what you're doing, so we're going to fix it for you. Um, but in terms of Clean Missouri itself, there are many provisions of the constitutional amendment that passed, um, things like lobbyist gifts limiting that to $5. Um, the most important piece of it, which is the most controversial piece, is how the district lines are drawn. Missouri had a very convoluted system of uh, how we drew our, our district lines. And you can see that mine is actually one of the best districts in terms of not being crazy. <laughs> in terms of, you know, the weirdest chunk for me is like probably this one here. Um, but we have districts, I, I was in Kansas City and my friend represented West Rogers District, and we were driving down the street 
and it was like <coughs> two streets was his, the next two streets were somebody else's, the next two streets were somebody else's, and then they went back to his. We were literally in Clark in his car, and he goes, mine, John's, Lawrence. And I was like, what? Um, and so the way the lines were drawn before it was completely partisan. So we as legislators got to pick. Um, there were groups of people, and as minority leader, I would get to choose who those people are, who then go literally in a back room and would draw the maps. Then the maps would be submitted to the Senate for approval, like there was a process, and then there's a process to go to the courts if you didn't agree with it. Um, it was a very lengthy thing, but ultimately it was us deciding who sat in that room. And the way Clean Missouri makes it is a nonpartisan demographer hired by the state auditor, whoever that person may be at the time, hires them. They have to have a slew of qualifi qualifications. It's, I looked at the job description, there's probably 10 people in the whole country who are qualified to do this work. Um, and then they pick a person, the Senate has to approve that person to have the job, then they draw the maps, and then they go back through the same process through the legislature for approval and then to the courts if, if it's so deemed necessary. The biggest difference is now we have a person doing it, the initial maps versus us. The rest of the process is the same. Um, I personally would prefer it to be out of the hands of politicians um, drawing those maps. I have seen in my time as a volunteer, um, people drawn out of their districts. My predecessor, Representative Knorr, lives just north of my district line on Broadway. And so my district before used to encompass Charlie. It went up, and his house was literally on the corner of the district that he had. After the 2010 uh, census, it was redrawn, and he was drawn out, you can see, by two blocks. Um, that happened all over the state, on both sides of the aisle, um, creating primaries and et cetera, but what's unfortunate about it is, I mean, you can never say that it was personal or not, right? Like, it's very easy to make the argument, well, you guys didn't like Charlie, so you cut him out by a block, like that's, and that happened all over the state. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But taking it out of the hands of politicians really makes sure that it is not going to be a biased situation. Okay, and I have another question, uh, especially if you get an opportunity to follow your representatives on social media, you should. You're not my representative, but you're a great follow on Twitter, especially. Uh, highly recommend you follow her on social media. What are you on social media? Facebook, Twitter? Instagram and Snapchat. And Snapchat, okay. Um, so again, uh, because we have a representative here, I, I do encourage, if you do have any questions, not just about Missouri, but also about Springfield. She lives here. Uh, about the United States as well, although she's not federal, uh, is welcome to weigh in. Uh, something you tweet a ton about is about whether, uh, about Medicaid. Um, should, uh, this is from a combination combo question from Macy Mitchell and Soon Parr. Uh, what are the causes of young children losing health insurance and are you in favor of expanding Medicaid in Missouri? Yeah. So um, you all have may have seen in the news in the past about year and about a year now, um, we have had a decline in our Medicaid enrollment at the tune of about 125,000 people. Of those, most of them are children. Uh, about 105,000 are children who within the last year have no longer been covered by Medicaid. So February of last year, uh, we started to see these numbers. Every month we get uh, numbers from the department showing enrollment status and this and that. And we started to see a rapid decline in the state of Missouri. And so we started asking a lot of questions about what was going on. Um, for a long time, the administration was saying everything's fine, the economy's better, these people just don't want Medicaid anymore. Then the conversation switched to a federal change in the ACA that mandated you had to have uh, insurance coverage to then that being rolled back so you no longer are mandated in, in the country to have health insurance. So then the conversation from the administration was that, well, since they don't have to have it, they just don't want it, and they're not getting coverage. Well, finally, about a month ago, um, we heard from um, a Republican colleague of mine who sits on budget who has admitted that we know for certain there are 60,000 children in Missouri who do qualify for Medicaid and should have it, but don't. And so at this point, we're trying to, and we have been this whole time, trying to figure out what is the cause of this. These families have been contacting my office, along many of them, saying, you know, we had insurance, went to the doctor, and we were told we didn't have Medicaid anymore. What's going on? We were never contacted by the department, never received forms, never, like, we thought we had insurance and we don't. So I've been helping for months people get back on Medicaid as quickly as possible for those who qualify. Um, for these 60,000, and this is a very complicated, weedy answer, but for the 60,000 children specifically that fall in this bracket, Missouri Medicaid has multiple avenues of coverage. We have a full family plan, we have children only, and then we have um, 
mothers, um, so pregnant moms, and then we also have a thing for substance addicted parents as well. Um, and what we were seeing is family plan that had mom and three kids, for instance. Mom no longer qualified because we were not doing our check on income regularly for the past four or five years as a state. We just weren't following federal rules. And so we finally started following federal rules and we did a check. Mom no longer qualifies. Children still do qualify for the children's plan over here. What the state did, instead of moving the kids over here, is we kicked everybody off. And those who did receive a letter, which a lot of folks claim that they didn't, um, and you know we're talking about a transient group of people, the addresses may not be up to date. The letter did not say, hey mom, you no longer qualify, but your kids do, and you need to reapply over here. It just says nobody qualifies anymore. And so what the administration is saying now is that those families need to reapply to get their kids covered. Now what we've been digging into is we believe that we are actually violating federal rule because as a state, we should automatically move those kiddos over and we're not. And so there's a whole lot going on with CMS at the federal level because Missouri has just violated all sorts of rules. But very long story short is we have at least 60,000 people that we know should have Medicaid coverage that qualify based on their income and they don't. This other 50,000 that we're looking at, um, you know, the, we're still digging in to figure out exactly what happened with that population because it's a different scenario. Those are more um, just, we don't know exactly what happened at this point. So we're still looking at it. If you know anyone who thinks that they should have Medicaid and they don't, please have them call my office and we will get them re-enrolled as quickly as possible. Second question, yes, I support Medicaid expansion. <laughs> um, it's part of the problem that we're seeing with our Medicaid population now. The form you have to fill out to get Medicaid is 64 pages long. 64 pages. So, <laughs> I, as a social worker, when I look at these forms, I can't figure it out. I don't understand them. And I'm trained in this world to read this language. Um, part of the Medicaid expansion, one of the benefits of that, is we have seen states have their Medicaid form be as small as a postcard. Because the change of the qualifications is so vastly different that we could do that. There's also federal money to help with our IT system that a lot of folks don't talk about that could make this go much smoother. On top of that, we have 2,000 people, approximately, who don't currently qualify for Medicaid under our rules, but also don't qualify for the ACA discounts that you all have heard about. So these are working people in Missouri who would qualify if we were to expand Medicaid. Those moms that I was talking about, like that mom who had the three kids and lost her coverage, she would then qualify if we were to expand Medicaid. Um, so I am, as I started this conversation, somebody who fully supports health care coverage. If we were to expand Medicaid, we would still get a 90% match from the federal government, so that means we'd spend 10% and they would spend 90%. So that money is still there. Um, the Missouri Budget Project, Washington University, all of these entities who have studied the economics of this say that this will actually save our state money by investing in people's health care up front because we are spending so much on the back end for people who are not getting health care coverage and get that, that preventative care. So yes. uh, anybody have a question that jumps to mind for our uh, minority leader here? I don't remember exactly what the act was called, but um, coming from a religious standpoint, if we didn't agree with, or say an organization didn't agree with everything that was on the bill, would they be um, eligible to be like sued if they didn't want? Like churches don't usually hire anyone that's not of their denomination. We go back to the Missouri Non Discrimination yes. Act. Yes. Yeah, yes. So there are exclusions. There are exclusions. Okay. Yeah, um, particularly like when you're looking at like Catholic schools and that kind of stuff. Yes, okay. there are exclusions. I do want to ask about that. Is that is a question from another student, yeah. uh, Sydney Black, 11 a.m. Uh, when she asks about the Mona Act, uh, she says she was in a pride club, and uh, she asks, "How do you handle fighting for non-discrimination against sexuality?" And she wants to know how you stay level-headed to get your point across. Mm -hmm. um, Staying level-headed is a hard conversation in general, um, and that that is not just a partisan thing. You know, like we leave our families for five months out of the year and don't get paid a whole lot of money. I make thirty-five thousand dollars a year to be gone for five months. Um, it's not the the most ideal situation. Um, so staying level-headed is is multifaceted for me. Um, as cheesy as it sounds, like 
once a day. I walk around the building, <laughs> and it's a very beautiful place if you've never been there, and try to remind myself about the historical impact of just simply being there. Um, so I, each one of us have our own like little things that kind of keep us going. Um, but for me, honestly, I stay level-headed by doing things like this, by being in the community and talking to people. Right before I was here, I was at Big Mama, sitting with a group of eight people who care about environmental issues, and they were like, this is how we want you to vote. And we had a great discussion on like six different pieces of legislation. Um, having conversations with my constituents about why they want me there and what they want me to do is really what keeps me going, um, particularly when we're dealing with the issue of Mona. Um, you know, just this week we had two very divisive um, anti-LGBT bills that had hearings, one dealing specifically with trans youth, and we had a whole bunch of um, you know, middle school kids who are transgender uh, in my office sharing their stories and crying with me about feeling attacked and blah, blah, blah. And uh, those are the things that, that really keep me level-headed. Uh, what was the second piece of that question? Um, just uh, how did you handle fighting for non-discrimination? against sexuality? I think the hardest, uh, the, when we're dealing with the LGBT community, um, which I am an ally, I do not identify as a member of the community, but I still view it as one of the most important issues of my generation. Um, when we're dealing with this across the board, I try to remember that most of the people in Jefferson City is not malicious. I think a lot of this is about confusion, particularly when we're dealing with the trans community. Um, a lot of folks are ignorant, not in a negative sense, but just unexposed to a lot of things. And this could go beyond the issue of the LGBT community. This is just, if you disagree with something, a lot of times it's just not about, it's more about not understanding where somebody is coming from. And so particularly when we're dealing with the LGBT issues in Jefferson City, the things that I try to do is have open and honest conversations in a, in a safe way with these people, uh, letting them ask questions about things they don't understand and not getting upset about it. Um, for the first time in Missouri's history, uh, I flew the trans and pride flags outside of my office. We got in trouble for that, so there are no longer flags in the hallway, in case you're curious as to why, it's my fault. Um, <laughs> but we had them out there, and I will tell you, I had about six different colleagues of mine come up and ask what the trans flag was, told them, and then they're like, why would you fly it? And that opened a conversation that really helped people try to understand more from the other perspective. And I just try to remember that a lot of this isn't malicious. It's um, whether it's fear, whether it's protecting their own religion, whether it's protecting their families, whatever they feel is, is the avenue for filing a lot of these anti-bills that we're seeing this year. And I think it's important to share personal stories, to bring individuals to talk about their own personal experiences and why something like Mona is important to them, but then also to hear the other side and, and try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, another question uh, regarding some of the debates we've seen. We've seen so there was a really explosive debate a couple days ago. We here at Class have watched a Democratic debate. And we have seen, if you want to go back to health care, yeah. uh, we have seen, uh, this is from Caleb Sappington, 10 a.m. Democratic presidential candidates have brought up the idea of Medicare for all. How does this help most Missourians? And will, in your opinion, Medicare for all have a negative impact to the Missouri economy? Um, so I will preface this with I have not watched a single Democratic debate this cycle, and that's very yeah. intentionally. Um, I know. I, I read the highlights, and I, you know, watch the clips afterwards, but um, I got a lot going on in Missouri, and I'm just keeping my head clear. Um, but to answer your question, Medicare for All. So um, I do, do believe in Medicare for All. I think it is something that um, will help our country. I think, I, again, going back to looking at cost analysis of health care, when we invest on the front end, people seeing their doctors regularly, have access to dental, which is one of the biggest expenses that we have because it leads to heart disease and all sorts of other things if you're not taking care of your dental. Um, our kids who are seen um, at, at, by doctors at the first five years of their life, et cetera, we see a huge cost savings on the back end when it comes to uh, particularly looking at elderly care. Um, Missouri specifically is seeing a huge influx in the amount of elderly that we have to care for. And when we're looking at things like nursing homes versus in-home care, the cost differences between those things, um, it's exponential. And we're going to see a huge increase in how much money the state is spending on the elderly population. If we are able to get those folks into care and treatment sooner, get them on the right medications, et cetera, that's going to save us a whole lot of money in the back end. When it comes to the presidential level, um, going from zero to 100 is going to be very difficult. And it's not something that, that I believe can happen overnight. Um, 
you know, when we look at the other countries in the world, most of them are doing some sort of uh, Medicare for All coverage plan. Um, I am not necessarily against some of the transitional programs that some of the presidential nominees are offering up uh, with the understanding that, you know, it takes time. And no matter who our president is, Congress is the one who's going to implement whatever these plans look like. And so I am looking at this as a, we've got to be open to the whole gamut of discussion. Any other questions, thoughts, based on uh, things that Quaid has said or any concerns you may have for Missouri or America? Just keep asking. You and I will just uh, go to your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Do you think that, and this is what I really love about America, is that we can kind of just try things in one state, and if it doesn't work there, maybe try it in another state, and if it works great, we can kind of implement it better. Do you think we should do the Medicare for all in like just one state or here and there? Kind of like legalizing marijuana, yeah. and trying in all these states, seeing how it works, and then maybe one day implement it federally. I think, I mean, yes and no. Um, medical marijuana is a great example. I spent four hours in a hearing this week about the, med the medical marijuana implementation in Missouri and how it's epically failing. Um, we have, we'll have over 600 lawsuits that the state of Missouri is going to be participating in and paying for because our rollout has been so terrible. I will tell you that our rollout, we looked at every other state that did medical marijuana and tried to do best practices. And it's going to cost our state a ton of money. Um, and so, like, logically, yes, I think that when we do that, it's smart and we need to be slow and deliberative on any policy that we're doing. I am someone that fully believes that a policy needs to be vetted and we really need to take our time and slow down. We pass way too many laws in this country, in our state. Our constitution is way too big. But at the same time, some of these things, like the medical marijuana rollout, we, it can be damaging when it comes to the cost or the negative implications of doing a rollout wrong state by state, <coughs> looking at incarceration conversations, looking at, I mean, the medical marijuana, we could go on forever about that. Um, specifically to healthcare, we have seen some states do their own versions. Indiana um, has an Indiana plan, then they did an Indiana plan 2.0, and then they, you know, we've seen some states try different things. Um, I just, I continue to go back to me, healthcare is a right, in my opinion. I think that it's something that we should be looking at from a national level, and particularly when we're looking at the cost analysis of what healthcare is doing to everyone in our country, I would prefer to see something happen at the national level that then the states can opt in, opt out, just like expansion. You know, states can opt in and then opt out if they don't like it or they can, you know, I, I think that that opt in, opt out conversation is something I'd be open to. I just think that it, the negative effects of doing a state by state is damaging. A uh, question from Michael Mudry, 9 a.m. He says, uh, what are you actively doing in the Missouri House? to push our schools and education to make it more affordable and accessible for students wanting to go beyond a high school degree? Yes, so um, affordable and accessible for our education system is a very hard thing to do in the state of Missouri right now. Uh, we are a balanced budget state, in case you all don't know, so that means if we want to increase funding to anything, it has to come from somewhere else. And we also have cut our corporate tax rate um, every year for the past plus years, so the amount of general revenue that we have to spend gets smaller, um, which is uh, problematic in my opinion. Um, what I personally am doing, you know, so we've worked on the budget side of things um, to try to increase funding. Last year, um, Missouri State got a whole lot of money, <laughs> um, which was really great. We, we brought um, some programs down here. This year, we're fighting to, for our community colleges, honestly, which is why I'm really glad to be standing in this room to have this conversation. Our community colleges have all teamed up together which this might be the very first time that it's ever happened, to have a conversation around, around equi equitableness. And it's really great for us because OTC, while we're the largest one in the state, and in my opinion, the most effective, we are still getting the least amount per student than any other community college in the state right now. And so all the community colleges, and Dr. Higdon has done a great job on this, have gotten together to bring an equitable um, formula so all of our financial stuff on the education front is done by formulas, and we won't get into that, but um, to bring it so that we are back up into a more equitable line so that we're getting more money per student at OTC so that we're actually um, comparable to the other community colleges. So I'm definitely working with our budget team to try to get that done. Um, that's going to be 
we'll see how it, how it lands this year. We're really early in the budget process. But then we're also looking at other things that, um, how to increase funding um, for different grant applications, trying to look at um, partnering with our businesses. There are things like Fast Track and some of these other uh, things that the governor has gotten passed that bring more money for our students who are specifically looking at different fields and trying to come back to school. Um, so we're looking at things like that to try to um, make it easier for folks. But ultimately, for me, I think we just need more money over here um, so that the cost of tuition doesn't continue to increase, which is one of the biggest problems that we're seeing. I got a combo of questions from Sarah Terry and Hannah Slavens about, uh, I'll just throw it to you, about minimum wage. Um, we voted in November to raise it gradually. They both want to know uh, what your opinion on a $15 an hour minimum wage is. Yeah, uh, so minimum wage is a convoluted conversation for me as a social worker. I am 100% um, in, in favor of living wages. And if you look statistically, $15 an hour is actually not enough um, based on the cost of living in, in the state of Missouri. It's more around $18 an hour. Um, that said, um, I also understand from a small business standpoint, my husband is a small business employer. We employ about 38 people here in, in Springfield. And so I do understand the ramifications of going from 8 to 15 really quickly and what that does to our small businesses. All that said, I do think that the gradual increase that the Missouri voters passed is a good way to tackle this. I am a believer that when we are increasing wages, it does help the small business employers because people are then spending their money in their community locally, um, particularly when you're looking at minimum wage employees. This is not the demographic, and I can include myself in this as somebody who w waited tables most of my life. Um, this is not a demographic that's going to put that money into savings or into investment properties like the wealthy. These are folks who spend the money. And so um, I am definitely a believer that increasing the minimum wage helps our local economy, and I fully support it. Um, you will see bills moving that are trying to undo that vote that voters just did, because that's a common th theme in Jefferson City right now. And um, so those are moving uh, to undo different pieces of that, um, but it's yet to be seen if they're going to get any traction. Any questions? How do you um, propose raising minimum wage and making health care available for everyone without taxes raising? How, we, how do you think that we will pay for that? I think we should raise taxes on the rich. Any other? Yeah, so going back to um, medical marijuana, what do you think? Um, so there's two provisions already this year that will introduce recreational marijuana into uh, Missouri. With the troubles that medical marijuana is facing with Missouri, what is going to be, how detrimental is recreational marijuana going to be if, if it gets past the cycle? I don't view those things as overlapping. I, I do think that they will be handled separately. Um, so when we passed medical marijuana, the governor created a pot czar. Uh, his name is Lyndall Fraker. Former state representative is now the pot czar for Missouri. Um, and his job was to do the rollout of medical marijuana. Um, the, the problems that we're seeing with the rollout is more on the licensing side. Um, we use a third party vendor um, to decide who gets what license. And there are a lot of um, discrepancies in how people got licenses to the extent of I'm a business owner and I have three different businesses and I fill out an application and I literally copy and paste my answers and one scored higher than the others and I got a license here and not over here. Yeah, so there's there's more problems on that side of things than, uh, and so when I say issues with the rollout, it's more about that than I think the actual marijuana.